tell you a little bit about the final project in this class. So um, right now we're getting ready to enter into the final unit. So we're going to talk about uh, multilingualism and um, sign language for our last unit. So this is the, the only unit where we talk about two topics fused together. But they're both relatively brief. Um, but this is what the last quiz will be over, multilingualism and sign language. Um, and once we get through that unit and we take the quiz on that unit, then our focus in the class shifts a little bit to working on everyone preparing for their final in-class presentation. So everybody in the class will have to give um, a 10-minute presentation uh, about uh, one of the application projects that we've done in class or an original project that they propose. Um, so that, uh, that project will have the, a PowerPoint or Prezi supplement, because you need to have something up here to present with, and then you will uh, talk to the class and impress them with your ability to uh, describe either Dothraki, uh, your uh, speech processing project, or your original project. Um, now people have done original projects on things like sign language, uh, other languages that they know. Um, they've done projects on language acquisition, because that's something they were interested in and they wanted to do a project on that. So if you have a topic that you're interested in, uh, I want you to come see me and we can talk about what a final project on that topic would, would look like. We can make sure that you have enough to talk about. Um, and everyone gets check-in points for being here while other people are giving their presentations and doing peer review. Um, you also get check-in points for coming to meet with me the week before we do presentation so that we can talk about, you can show me what you've got and I can make sure that your slides are looking good and that we, we're cleaning up things that might cause you to lose points and things like that so that your presentation is solid. Um, so we have a whole week where we don't meet at all because I'm just taking time to meet with people outside of class. Uh, and then we have a week of presentations and then we have a final exam and class is done. So we're kind of fast tracking it to the end. Um, so your final project is worth 100 points um, and that project gets graded in four categories. So 40% is the content, so how well you hit on all the important points, um, how clear and creative and interesting the project is, how well you present it. So when you stand up here, do you stand up here and stare at your note cards? And do you come in in cutoffs and a t-shirt that says bite me or, or do you, <laughs> you know? I've actually had students come in, you know, I, mean, I want you to come in and give a presentation. I'll, this is a senior seminar, so I want you to come in and show off your best presentation. Um, and then there's detail where I will give you uh, points for things like uh, APA style um, and you know making sure you proofread and all that other stuff. So this uh, handout is available online in the application projects folder. As I said, I would have printed it out, but the printer died, so I'm just putting it up here. But so you can see what each thing will cover, uh, each unit, each or each part of the project. If you do an original proposal, like we need to agree on what it is you're doing by April 3rd. So come see me during office hours, come to me with your ideas and make sure that we have an idea about what you're gonna talk about for 10 minutes uh, by April 3rd. Um, so I've given you some tips, of, uh, things you have to know about the project. Um, you have to have at least 15 slides. That doesn't count your title slide, your end slide, or your references slides. You have to have at least 15 slides. Um, I don't care if you use PowerPoint or if you use Prezi, but it has to be something that I can upload, or you can upload to um, Brightspace and that we can project in class. Um, you can use notes while you present, but you can't read your notes. I don't want you to have notes with you, but you can't stand there and read them. Also, you can't stand here and read what's on your slides, because we all know how much fun it is to watch somebody read to us during class, right? We love to do that. Um, and which means you need to rehearse. So one of the reasons that I'm giving you a week out of class uh, is so that 
you can not only work on your presentation, but you can practice it. So that when you get up here, it's clear that you know what you're talking about and you're presenting with confidence. Uh, you, you know, this is your project. You're showing off what you learned about psychology and language uh, for those 10 minutes. There are no makeups. So if you're, you sign up to give your presentation on a particular day and you don't come, that's just a zero. Okay, so you can't make it up. Um, the only exception to that, of course, would be if we had a snow day. Uh, <laughs> I'm not thinking that's likely to happen in April. Uh, so uh, my guess is that, uh, we're, and I'll give you an opportunity to pick the day, so there'll be uh, several days when people can present, we'll present over the course of three or four days, and you'll get to choose your slot. So and you have to have your presentation uploaded by that morning for it to be on time. So if you're thinking, oh, I'm gonna need extra time, then you might wanna pick one of those later slots. If you're like, I want to get this over with because I have a bunch of other stuff I have to worry about, then you might want to pick an earlier slot because then your presentation's done. And at that point, all you have to do is come to class, watch other people give their presentation, and, uh, and study for the final. So uh, everybody in class is going to be doing peer evaluation of everybody else's presentation. And I will look over those um, and consider the feedback that people give on those forms. Both Marjorie and I will be evaluating the presentations. And if we're looking at a presentation and we're giving it things, you know, if we're giving it like, you know, a scale of one to five, if we're going three, four, two, three, whatever, and people are just going five, 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 I'm gonna be like, that's not really a fair evaluation. Okay. So I, you know, I'll, I will consider how many points you get if your evaluation is just all five, five, five. If I'm not thinking it's all five, 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 and you're like just, eh, it was perfect. Everything about this was great. Absolutely no problems. I'm like, that's not really, meaningful feedback. So please be thoughtful when you give feedback because I will be looking at it and I will be considering how many points to give you for your feedback based on how thoughtful I think that it was. Because if your classmates are working hard to give a good presentation, then I would really like you to work hard to give them some meaningful feedback about how they did. So um, that's the next project. Uh, I will have everybody's graded application projects too. I think I'll have the stuff finished up uh, by next class period to give back to you. Um, just something to keep in mind. In order to propose an original project, you have to have passing grades on both of the other projects. If you don't pass one of the other projects, then you need to go back and either fix the project you didn't get a passing grade on, or take the project that you did get a passing grade on and improve it. But before you can propose something new, I need to see that you've done well on the, the previous projects. Does anybody have any questions about this? <coughs> right now you're like, oh my gosh, it's Monday, we just got back from spring break, and now you're telling us we have to do a project. Okay. Okay, that's good. I can live with that. All right, so starting today, we're going to be talking about multilingualism. How many people in here speak more than one language? Okay, so actually, it turns out that in the world, it's more common than not to speak more than one language. Um, in the United States, we're relatively unusual in that we have a larger proportion of people who are monolingual. Uh, but across the world, what's more typical is for people to speak more languages. Uh, lots of people grow up in communities where, you know, just over the hill, people are speaking a completely different language. Uh, countries are smaller, certainly much smaller than the United States. Uh, people travel much more across country borders. And so we see a lot, it's a lot more common for people to at least be basically conversational in multiple languages. Uh, we see a greater concentration of multilingualism in big cities because that's where people tend to immigrate to from different parts of the world. So if you want to, you know, if you go to New York City or if you go to Chicago, if you go to LA, you're going to hear a lot more languages than you're going to hear in Le Mans. Um, so you know, in big cities and large cities, and of course here, you know, you can go out and drive down, drive down some roads, go out to Dufort Highway, right? And there are signs in Vietnamese and Korean and Chinese and Spanish. And you know, that's because this in, in big metropolitan areas like this, we see a lot more opportunity for uh, people who speak different languages to succeed. 
larger communities of people who have immigrated, and so you're more likely to encounter people who, on a regular basis, use multiple languages in their lives. Now, when we talk about language acquisition for multiple languages, we kind of divide it into two categories. You can either become bilingual or multilingual simultaneously, or you can do it sequentially. If you are simultaneously bilingual, what that means is that you've grown up using both languages. And we'll just talk about two for right now, although this, the same thing works with three or more languages. So you learn in parallel. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is my, my friend. You, any of you have Dr. Masuda for class? Dr. Masuda, he's a, a clinical psychologist in our department. He's obviously a native Japanese speaker. Uh, his wife is uh, bilingual in Spanish and English, and they have a daughter, Kyoko. Kyoko is growing up speaking Spanish, English, and Japanese in parallel. Because her dad talks to her in Japanese, mom talks to her in Spanish, and then at school, when she goes to daycare, they talk to her in English. So she speaks all three languages, and she's two, oh my gosh, she's super cute. And it just blows my mind that she just, she goes back and forth, and that's, Totally fine, doesn't think a thing about it. Um, so she is experiencing simultaneous trilingualism. So she's, uh, she's learning all three languages in parallel. Sequential bilingualism is when you learn one language and we call that your L1, okay? So that's your first language. And then once that one is pretty well seated, you develop another language. Now, people who are simultaneously bilingual sound like native speakers. People who are sequentially bilingual may or may not sound like native speakers in the languages they acquire after their births. I don't sound like a native speaker in Japanese. I just don't have the fluency. Although, when I'm living in Japan and I'm interacting in Japanese all the time, I do pretty well. Uh, so the way I learn Japanese is definitely a form of sequential bilingualism, but if you grew up speaking both, two languages or three, that's, that's happening in parallel, we call that simultaneous. Now we spent a whole bunch of time talking about language acquisition for children. So let's talk about how acquisition might look different for children who are growing up with two L1s. Okay, that would be kids who are growing up with simultaneous bilingualism versus children who just have one L1. Okay, so children who are growing up monolingual. How is their language acquisition different? Well, if a child is growing up in a simultaneously multilingual environment, so maybe dad speaks Japanese, mom speaks Spanish, the kid's growing up in this environment. The sequence, so the, the, the things that they go through, Things like cooing, babbling, uh, the holoprastic stage, the telegraphic stage, those things are the same okay, for both languages. Uh, they go through the same sequence. They acquire grammar and phonemes at, in a, at a similar rate to someone who was just learning one of the two languages. Now there might be some slight differences. They might be a little bit slower in some cases. But what these kids can do is if they figure out a particular kind of grammar is important in one language, then they can start trying to figure out if it's important in the other language they speak. So they kind of discover a grammatical idea in one language and then look to see if it actually matters in the other language that they speak. So they can kind of piggyback, go back and forth when it comes to learning different languages. Now, what I think is also really interesting about this is that this works even if the modality of the languages that the kids are learning are not the same. So if you have a child that's learning American Sign Language as one of their languages, and a verbal language like English as one of their languages, and just so you know, American Sign Language and English are actually not related. American Sign Language is based on French. The grammar and stuff is much more connected to French. So the, 
you have, they're learning these two different languages in different modalities, and you will still see that the child will, now assuming that the child is hearing, right, so they're actually getting information about this verbal language, the child will babble in sign, and they, they do babble, their hands form shapes, they practice trying to make their hands form signs, and they'll do things with their hands that children who aren't learning sign language don't do. They form shapes with their hands. Um, and they will babble in sign, and they will, in parallel, babble trying to practice English phonics. It's really cute. And then when they move into the holophrastic stage, right, the one word stage, they start making one word signs, and they start producing one word verbal utterances. So they do them in parallel. Children tend to, if, they're, if they are doing a manual and an oral language, they will tend to do the manual thing first because they tend to have more control over what's happening with their hands than they do the, what's happening with their faces. So, or with their vocal cords. Um, and it's much easier for them to see what's happening with their hands than it is to feel what's happening in their mouths. So, um, but they will learn and they will develop the two languages in parallel. Now, what makes this work best is when the parents or the caregivers use a one person, one language policy. And what that means is they need to help create in real space, real time, the distinction between the two languages. So for example, Dr. Masuda speaks Japanese to his daughter, and his wife, Migdalia, speaks Spanish to her. So Kyoko knows that when she's talking to dad, she uses one set of rules, and those are just the rules that happen to be the Japanese rules. And when she's talking to her mom, she uses a different set of rules. Those are happen to be the Spanish rules. So, when you do that one person, one language policy, it helps create this reality that, well, this is the way I talk to dad and this is the way I talk to mom, and that's just how you talk, right? And so different people, you just use different rules to talk to different people. Um, and they talk to each other, because he doesn't really speak Spanish and she doesn't really speak Japanese, they talk to each other in English, so she hears them speaking English to each other too, which she knows because she hears that at school all day where her teachers don't speak Spanish or Japanese. So she can understand what's going on in there, but she pretty typically speaks to them um, in the language that they direct to her. And you'll get that it's easier for her to develop those languages clearly if she knows, okay, uh, how to keep them separate in the beginning. It gets difficult for a child when you see a lot of interference. Um, uh, if it, be or, I should say, it becomes more challenging for the child to keep things separate if people don't do that. If the caregivers switch around a lot, so sometimes you speak in one language and sometimes you speak in another, then the kid's like, okay, wait a second, what, which set of rules am I supposed to use with you? And it makes, them hard, it, makes it harder for the child to kind of create separate systems to separate out which grammatical rules go together. And that's, that's the big challenge. Um, if you see also some conflict, if the languages have different ways of representing things grammatically. So for example, if the child is speaking a language like, um, pick one like Finnish, in Finnish, there's no marking anywhere of gender. Nothing, gender doesn't get marked. Gender doesn't matter. So, I mean, you will indicate, you can identify a person's perceived gender, but there's not things like uh, objects don't have gender. Whereas in a lot of romance languages, you do see objects having gender. Um, so, you might have, for example, And this isn't a romance language, but I do know German, so I can use this as an example. Uh, in German, a garage, like the garage for your car, is die Garage. It's 
it's marked as a feminine noun. Okay. A garage is feminine. A little girl, das Mädchen, is neutral. Okay. Das is a neutral article. And then, you know, der Hund, the dog, is male. Whether it's a male or female dog, he referred to it as der Hund. Okay. That's masculine. So you can mark gender of things. Nouns have a gender. This happens in Spanish. Uh, happens in a lot of languages where you might have the the word for the indicates whether something is masculine or feminine, and it's a grammatical gender. It's not about the actual gender. I mean, I don't think anyone really thinks a garage is female, okay. or uh, that a garage is a particularly feminine thing. But in German, it's marked as a feminine noun. You know, if you speak one language that does that, marks all these things with different genders, and you have another language that doesn't. That can be confusing if the child has figured out how to do all the gender stuff and then in the other language doesn't have to do it. Or if the child figures out the language that doesn't do all the gender marking and then has to do it for the other language. It can also be confusing if the languages do things like mark gender, but they do it differently. So in some cases, one language might say a garage is feminine or another language might say that it's masculine. So it's different rules. For, or different ways of marking it for <laughs> different languages. So uh, if the languages do that differently, you could have some issues. Um, English and Japanese. English is a preposition language, so we say things like, I'm going to put the book on the table, where on comes before the thing I'm going to put it on. Japanese is a postposition language. So you would say, table on. So it's totally opposite. And so if you're learning English and Japanese, in the beginning, kids get mixed up about where they're supposed to put the word that means on. Because in one language, it goes before, and in another language, it goes after. In one language, you have to say, on the table, and in the other language, doesn't have any word for the or a at all. So you never use articles for anything. And that creates some confusion, because you really have to build super different syntactic structures. Now, if you happen to speak languages that are related, like say you're learning French and Italian, you're golden, right? Because those languages are actually related and have a lot of similar forms and similar grammar. So things that you learn to speak French help you speak Italian, which is why when someone speaks French, it might be much easier for them to pick up Italian or Spanish or another language that is really similar, because they can basically piggyback what they know from one language to help them learn the other one. So when caregivers switch, right, when they don't do that one person, one language thing, that's a problem. We call that code switching. Code switching doesn't have to be just for a whole language. We also code switch um, with dialects. We code switch in family groups. So for example, you might speak differently when you talk to me in my office about a serious topic than you would with your friends hanging out at a bar while you're drinking. You might use different vocabulary. You might use different grammatical constructions. Um, that's also code switching. So code switching is just using a different set of rules to communicate. So if the parents switch and use different languages, that makes it challenging for the child, because the child just isn't clear on what set of rules they're supposed to use. It's also difficult when the child has limited access to one set of rules. So it's actually much more challenging for, for example, for Kyoko to learn Japanese than it is for her to learn Spanish or English because she spends more time with the people in her life. Who's, I mean, she spends all day in daycare. And when she's home, her mom and her older sister both speak Spanish and speak Spanish to her. Um, and so the, o the only exposure she really gets to Japanese are her dad and her dad's Japanese friends or Japanese speaking friends like me. And we don't see her nearly as much as the people who spend time with her who speak Spanish and who speak English. So it's more challenging for her to develop her Japanese because she has less opportunity to gather data on Japanese and less opportunity to listen to adult Japanese and hear people communicate in it and just kind of take in data. So if you're acquiring an L1, how is that different than getting an L2? Okay, so L2 is that sequential second language. How is it different to acquire 
a language after you've already got one than it is to acquire a language from the beginning. We see that people who are acquiring an L2 tend to develop, they tend to figure out the rules of morphology and syntax in a slightly different order than native speakers. And part of the reason for that is if they already have an L1 in place, what they're very likely to do is try to use information from the L1 to help them figure out stuff from the L2. Because they already think in that L1. They already think in that first language. That's how they've organized their cognitive system, is with that language. And so as they try to acquire that new linguistic system, all that new grammar, those new rules, the new vocabulary, they're doing it through the mechanism of their first language. And so they might want to talk about different things. I mean, if you're acquiring a second language as an adult, what you need to talk about on a daily basis is really, really different than what you need to talk about when you're one and a half. And so you might focus on different syntactic structures, different vocabulary, different kinds of things, because those are things you think you need. Most adults don't get the luxury of getting to spend time talking about things that are only in their immediate environment. Right? What do little kids talk about? What do one and a half year olds talk about? They talk about the toys they like, the characters they like in books and on TV, the foods they like. It's pretty limited what they have to talk about. But as an adult, people want you to be able to talk about all the things adults talk about. And so that's more complicated. And so you might kind of bypass some simpler topics. And people might be less accommodating with making grammatical mistakes because you're older. And so they think you should be able to do more faster. And that creates a somewhat unnatural learning environment for language because Language is something that you personally develop by taking data out of the environment. Right? And you kind of figure it out as you go along, and people around you who already speak the language set standards for you that are a little bit far ahead, and you kind of keep chasing those standards until you sound like a native adult speaker. But adults don't really get to do that. They don't get to be in that environment. So it makes it very challenging for them to develop the language with the same level of sophistication because they kind of feel like they have to rush ahead and sound more adult right away. Um, where we see people make things like grammatical errors, where you, you're like, oh, a native speaker would never say it that way, is when they engage in something called language transfer. So that's where Someone is speaking, say for example, you might have had this experience, um, someone is speaking English, but they're using grammatical constructions that would never be used in English, but would be correct in their native language, like say Mandarin, Chinese. Um, and we call that language transfer. The person has taken a rule from, or a set of rules from their L1 and transferred them to their L2. So they're using them where they shouldn't. They're using them, in, I mean, it, and it doesn't create a lack of communicability. I mean, you could still understand what they mean, but they just don't sound like a native speaker. So, you know, if someone said, oh, the garage, she is very dirty. I would be like, she is very dirty? The garage is a she? That would be a really strange thing to do. But if in the language you speak, garage is marked as a feminine thing, then you might accidentally refer to the garage as a she, whereas I don't think any English speaker would ever refer to a garage as her. Now, an English speaker might refer to a boat as her, a car, modes of transportation for some reason. Get, get called girls, I don't know, or get to be feminine, I don't know what that's about. But that's also not true. You can also have, you know, male modes of transportation. But anyhow, but you can do that. But that's a peculiarity of English. It's not a gender marking. 
you can also completely legitimately refer to a car as it and no one is shocked. Right? It just suggests that you don't have any special affection for it. When we attribute gender to inanimate objects, that suggests some kind of affection. Oh, you know, I just, I love my car, Brad. You've seen that car commercial with the woman who has the car, Brad. She's like, and we love Brad, and Brad was with you through three jobs and two boyfriends, and oh, you know, he was your best friend ever, you know, your car, Brad. And like, when you name your car, things like that. So it suggests affection, but it's not necessarily grammatically marked. But when you see someone or you hear someone do that, what they're doing is they're just transferring stuff from their first language to the language that they're using as an L2. This is also why people have accents. It's because they're using the phonological rules and the phonemes of their native language, of their L1, and trying to force them into a system that's different, their L2. And that the phonemes and the phonology, we learn to take that very, very early, right? I mean, kids are already, by the time they're 12 months old, have pretty much separated out their categories for the phonemes for the language that they're learning. And so that the, the sound system of your language is really fundamental. It's one of the very first things we figure out to the point that even when very young children make phonological simplifications, they do it within the framework of the language that they're learning. Right? So when they, you know, when they do consonant cluster reduction or they do stopping or they do fronting, they don't stop or front or reduce into a form that's illegal in the language they're speaking. They're very sensitive to phonemes and phonological rules. And so those come really, really early. And those are the hardest things to reset or to build a second set for. So when someone is acquiring a second language, it's really hard in some cases for them to hear the difference between phonemes in the new language if those phonemes are all supposed to be the same thing in the same category in their L1. This is why my friends who speak Japanese have a really hard time hearing the difference between words like liver and river. Because l and r don't exist in their language. They're both part of the same category. They would think of them as the same phoneme. The closest thing they have is r. And they distinguish between phonemes like d and d. You heard the difference, right? D and d. So dexi and dexi. One means history and the other means death by drowning. Right? But you didn't hear the difference between those two things either because those phonemes are the same for you. And that makes it hard for you as an English speaker to learn Japanese. Because hearing those sounds or making consonant cluster combinations that you don't do in English makes it hard for you and makes you sound like a foreigner when you speak Japanese. Like being able to say things like ryo, ryo, ryo. Those are hard, those are just consonant clusters in Japanese and they're hard to do if you haven't practiced them a lot. And so you'll hear people say things like Kyoto, right? Every English, oh, I know all kinds of English they talk about Kyoto and Tokyo. <laughs> because it's Kyoto. Tokyo, but they don't want to k and ch, ch. People don't want to do that. Not before an O. We'll do it with cute, but we won't do it with kyo. You have to do kyo. And so that's why people sound funny when they speak English. I mean, when English people speak Japanese, they sound funny. Um, and I like to make my Japanese friends laugh by doing my English person speaking Japanese voice because it sounds completely different. And they're like, you don't even sound like you anymore. When I use all my English phonology, my English phonemes, to try and speak Japanese, it just makes them curl up and scream because they can't really pronounce that. All right, so when do we run into the biggest challenges? Uh, trying to make the switch, trying to build another language once you've already got one. Well, the easiest thing to do when you're talking about the sound systems is when the phonemic categories match. So for example, if the language has the same liquids, and it has the same nasals, and it has the same stops, then it's not hard, because the sound system you developed for your first language basically just transfers over without a lot of error to the second language. So you don't struggle very much. 
that's the easiest thing to do when the categories for the sound system match. The next best situation is where the categories for sound systems are really, really different. So, you know, maybe one language has a whole lot of one kind of stuff, and the other language has a whole bunch of other kind of stuff. You can keep them separate. When you're thinking, well, what do you mean? Well, for example, if you're trying to learn a click language, like Honsa. Okay. Now, I don't know, did you guys ever see the movie The Gods Must Be Crazy? Um, there's a, there are a number of languages uh, around the world where clicks, like those are actually all consonants. So if I say Mosa, um, and my friends who speak Mosa always tease me, they're like, oh my gosh, your consonants are so nasal. And I'm like, it's, and I'm, of course I can't hear it, but they say that I sound really strange because I, when I click, I breathe through my nose because that's the only way I can get my tongue to do what it's supposed to do. Um, but though, I mean, if I'm doing stuff in Mosa, then I switch, and the consonants are very different. The vowels are pretty much the same, so that's not hard for me to do. But the consonants are very, very different. Um, and it's easier to say, okay, these are all my Mosa consonants, and these are all my English consonants, and I can keep them separate because they're much more distinguished. The most challenging case, what makes it the hardest to get your L2 to sound right, is when the, the phonemic categories are kind of just partially shifted. So it's not that all the, you know, one language has p and one language has b, right? So they're totally separate, or both languages have b and p, that's fine. But if you're speaking two languages and both languages have some kind of p thing and some kind of b thing, but what one language counts as p, the other language counts as b, that's hard. Okay. So when the categories are just, because remember, these are just categories, right? We learn when we're acquiring a language what characteristics we should ignore and what characteristics we should pay attention to. And we develop those categories in our head based on the data we gather. So if you've already set up your phoneme categories at particular boundaries, particular voice onset times, for example, and then the new language you're trying to learn says, well, kind of, but shift over 10 milliseconds, and that will give you the right categories. Or shift over 20 milliseconds, and that will give you the right categories. That's really, really hard to do, because they're so similar to what you already know that it's very challenging for you to hear the necessary differences to build those new categories. So what people typically do in that situation is they just give up. And they don't worry about trying to sound perfectly native. They just say, I'm not going to worry about getting the consonants completely right or getting the vowels completely right. I'm going to rely on other things because they can. People will use things like context. They'll use what they know about language. Other people, native speakers, will use their top-down knowledge to repair the speech of the non-native speaker, to fix it so that they can understand what the person is saying. And the more experience they have with that non-native speaker, the better they'll be at that, right? If they say, oh, whenever this person says that sound, what sound they really mean is this. And their brain just figures that out and then does the corrections, just like if the person were making speech errors. And, you know, so the person is clearly trying, they're, they're doing what they have to do to communicate, and they're relying on listeners to also help them. But you can get into a challenging communica communication situation when you have someone who's speaking a language that they're not super good at yet, and someone, the person listening to them doesn't have a lot of experience with it, with the language that they do speak. So they struggle to understand what they're talking about. Um, because they, if the listener doesn't have enough top-down knowledge to do the necessary corrections, they may just say, I can't understand this person. And that can, that can create some difficulty. But, as long as both parties in the communication event are, are working at it, usually it works out. Now, sometimes parents who are raising their kids multilingual worry that their children will somehow be confused or 
delayed, won't do as well in school or something if they speak different languages to them at home. I've had parents come to me and say, well, so um, I speak English, my husband speaks Ukrainian, when should my husband start talking to the baby in Ukrainian? And I say, yesterday, uh, as early as possible. Uh, they say, but what about the disadvantages? What about the problems? What about the confusion? I'm worried that if my child has trying to, is trying to learn two languages, that they're not going to be able to read in English, or they're not going to be able to do these things at the right pace for school. Parents get really upset about this. They're so worried. Is my kid in the top reading group? Is my kid in the top language arts group? Is like, and they're they're freaking out that somehow having to learn two languages or more is going to result in the child somehow being cognitively delayed in the language that they use the most. And it is true that children who learn multiple languages do show some disadvantages relative to monolingual speakers. For example, multilingual people tend to have smaller vocabularies. Now, it's not that they have smaller vocabularies overall, it's that they know they have smaller vocabularies because they have vocabularies for multiple languages. So they actually know more words, they just know fewer words in each language than a monolingual speaker might in most cases. They just may know fewer words in each language that they know. If we have them perform certain kinds of cognitive tasks, that involve producing language. So for example, if we have them look at a computer screen and we ask them to name as fast as they can, name the pictures that they see on the computer screen, they are significantly slower in doing this. Now, when I say significantly slower, I'm talking about something that's measurable in milliseconds, fractions of a second. So they might be 50 milliseconds, 75 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds slower, so a tenth of a second. So slower, measurably slower, significantly slower uh, in naming. And they also make mistakes, more mistakes, than people who are monolingual. When they have to do comprehension, they're slower. They are able to demonstrate their comprehension at a slower rate. But again, we're talking about something that's measurable in fractions of a second, slower. But in mental terms, fractions of a second is a long, long time, right? Because we're making language-related decisions in one, two, three, four milliseconds. So having delays of 25, 30, 40, 50 milliseconds in mental time seems like a lot. And they tend to be less fluent, or verbally fluent, meaning that if you ask them to do something like, I want you to tell me all the words you can think of that rhyme with milk. Tell me all the words you know that begin with the R sound, or something like that. They are less skilled, They're, they don't do it as quickly as people who are monolingual. Now why do you think these things might be true? Why might it be that someone who speaks multiple languages has smaller vocabulary in both languages? Yeah. It's because they have to go back and forth between the two languages? Yeah, they have to go back and forth, and they have to be able to talk about the same things with everybody, right? It might also be that the languages could be limited. So for example, if you use one language at home and the other language at school, do you talk about the same things at home and school? No. So why would you learn words for things you never talk about? Yeah. Yeah, when I was a kid, because I, I know I talk Creole too. Mm -hmm. And so uh, at, in class, I would say words that I didn't know how to say in English in Creole. Mm -hmm. And they were like, what? 
And I'm like, is that not normal? <laughs> no. Actually, what, what you're doing is a, a completely normal thing called code switching. Yeah, so that's a, I mean, because especially if you don't have a word, and there are lots of, like, lots of words in the languages of the world that don't have a good translation into another, another language. Um, and there are actually books that have been written, really interesting books written about words that you can't translate into any other language because it just, there is no word for that thing. Like what did I read? I think um, Norwegian has a word for the feeling of euphoria when you're falling in love. Like it's a special word just for that. And I'm like, okay, like I don't have a word for that. I would have to say that feeling of euphoria when you're falling in love. I don't have a word for that, right? But they just say, oh, you know, or whatever their word is. I don't know what it is. But you know, languages have these words. So yeah, but that's a totally normal thing. When I'm talking with friends who um, also speak Japanese, I'll do the same thing. Well, I'll be talking along and then there'll be something that I can only express in Japanese, so I shift and I use Japanese words or Japanese phrase, and then I shift back into English and they do the same thing. So yeah, um, sometimes they're just things you can't express one way, or you just never learn the word for that thing because you, you know, I mean, I'm sure there are words for things, lots of words for things that I just you know, never use. I know, uh, you know you're studying words for the SAT and you're like, wait, there's a word for that? <laughs> never, you know. That's an English word, okay? Like, I don't know that word. Um, why do you think they would be slower about naming pictures or comprehending or producing speech? Yeah, they're, they're having to sort, right? Because they know if you ask them, tell me all the words you know that rhyme with milk. Mm -hmm. Well, what if they know words in both languages that rhyme with milk, but you're asking them in English, so then they have to go, okay, milk, silk, uh, and thinking maybe they know another word, but then they're like, oh wait, that's a, that's the wrong language. I'm not. That's not a, really a rhyme with milk. So they have to reject it. So they have to make these decisions on the spot and reject things. Right? They're sorting. Um, and we talk about verbal fluency. Um, you know, if you ask them to come up with things like semantic constraints, like tell me things that you can fit in your pocket, right? Or tell me, uh, you know other kinds of you know, things that will fit certain semantic restrictions. Um, well, those might be different culturally, right? Um, there might be things, you know, objects that exist in one culture that don't exist in another culture. And if you're talking in English, then you wouldn't use words for things that you would never find in an English-speaking country. All right, so yeah, there are some disadvantages that come from having dual or triple or quadruple language systems that come from having to sort and organize and select and reject options that monolingual people never have to do. So yeah, you will see some delays. But the advantages of being multilingual are overwhelming. Uh, because just like just like um, people who work out, if you spend time working out your arms, working out your legs, working at the core, you know, you're working on, you, you take time, and, you, and every day you're doing a little bit of work, extra work, that somebody who's sitting at home on the couch or playing video games isn't doing, you know, so maybe you have less time every day to dedicate to, um, playing World of Warcraft. That's true, you might not be as good at World of Warcraft as somebody who spends 14 hours a day playing World of Warcraft. But, <laughs> you can run a mile faster, you can lift more, your body is more resilient against illness. There's other advantages that, yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on what you value. But, when you speak multiple languages, you actually have a huge number of cognitive benefits that come from always having to do that little bit of extra work to produce every word, every sentence, every sound. If you're regularly having to do this selection and shifting, it actually builds you up cognitively, making you a little bit stronger in areas that can generalize to other benefits. So if you regularly have to shift back and forth between different dialects, different variants of a language, different languages, 
you are actually building cognitive strength and cognitive flexibility and cognitive resilience, meaning that if you experience some kind of damage to your brain, you might actually have a better chance of recovery if you speak multiple languages than if you just speak one. So there are actual physical benefits. So we'll go through these more in detail, and I'll show you a cool, I'll have you listen to a cool 